This panel discussion, which I have the honor to moderate, is an excellent illustration of what we sometimes hear, what a difference a year makes in two aspects. First, of course, is the fact that the unanticipated global pandemic means we are meeting in a virtual space instead in, of in person in Tel Aviv. And second, my guest in this session reflect tremendous changes that have taken place in the region this past year, when United Arab Emirates and Bahrain became the first Arab states to normalize relations with Israel in over a quarter century. Tonight's session will reflect on the significant development surrounding normalization agreements and consider a number of opportunities and challenges that await us in the near future. It is my privilege to introduce our distinguished speakers. His Excellency, Foreign Minister of Bahrain, Dr. Abdulatif bin Rashid El Zayani. His Excellency, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of the United Arab Emirates, Dr. Anwar Muhammad Gargash. And of course, Foreign Minister of Israel, my friend, General Gabi Ashkenazi. The format for this evening's conver conversation is that our guest from the Arab states will offer an opening remarks, followed by question and answer session. I would like to invite the Foreign Minister of Bahrain, His Excellency, Dr. Abdulatif Bidrashid El Zayani, to deliver his opening remarks. But first, let me tell our audience a little bit about your distinguished career. Prior to assuming his role as Minister of Foreign Affairs in February 2020, Dr. El Zayani was the Secretary General of the Gulf Cooperation Council, GCC. Before that, he had a decorated career in the Bahraini security establishment, where he served in a senior leadership roles including Deputy Chief of Staff for Operation, as well as Chief of Public Security, and he is retired with the rank of Lieutenant General in 2010. Your Excellency, please. Thank you, General Yedlin. Uh, I'm delighted to join you for this session of the INSS Annual Conference. And thank you uh, again, uh, General Yedlin, for the invitation to be part of this uh, discussion. I am genuinely looking forward to exchanging views and insights with Minister Gargash and Minister Ashkenazi on the consequences and implications of the Abraham Accords we signed last September. May I start by underlining how, for Bahrain, the Abraham Accords represent a natural progression based both on our long-standing culture of openness, tolerance, and dialogue, and also the recent tangible steps we have taken. For example, the Kingdom of Bahrain Declaration on Religious Tolerance of 2017, our hosting of the Peace to Prosperity Workshop in 2019, and last year's MOU between the King Hamid Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence and the U.S. State Department's Office of the Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism. All of these reaffirm Bahrain's outlook and approach and ensure that alongside the UAE and Israel, we are moving quickly to seize the opportunities ahead. Already, we have seen the three countries moving quickly to go beyond just establishing diplomatic relations and creating a broad and deep cooperation that rapidly delivers tangible benefits for all sides. And I think this has to be the right way forward both because of the immediate positive impacts it can have on all our countries, but also as a beacon for others, showing what can be achieved 
with good will and good faith on all sides. By doing so, we have the best chance of encouraging others to become involved, as we have already seen with Morocco and Sudan. Moving ahead, I am confident that this process of broadening and deepening our cooperation will continue, and that we will quickly and clearly be able to demonstrate that this has achieved both for our countries and for the region as a whole. Of course, delivering on the many agreements and MOUs signed will be important. But from what I have seen, here too, I am optimistic that words are effectively being translated into practice. From there, my hope and expectation is that the process will start to generate its own momentum. While I do not and cannot speak for anyone else, I would anticipate that more countries will engage and that a web of genuine cooperation will gradually spread across the Middle East, bringing true and lasting peace, security and prosperity for its peoples. And the momentum will also, I hope, be translated into renewed progress towards resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict on the basis of a two-state solution. In addition to building regional trust, the cooperation process set in motion with the Abraham Accords creates a clear motivation on all sides to renew efforts to reach an acceptable outcome and a strong disincentive against any steps which might impede or set back the process. Of course, there will always be some parties who will never be convinced and who will do all they can to attack and undermine our cooperation using outright falsehoods and the language of hate and division. Our best response, I believe, is twofold. First, to rally our international allies and supporters to our side in advocating for what we are doing. And secondly, to be very clear and very public about the motivation and agendas of those attacking us. Distinguished participants, for the foreseeable future, <clears throat> the Middle East will be a key area of international interest and concern. And the United States will continue to play an important role in its security and stability. I know that another session of this conference will dive more deeply into what the new US administration might mean for our region. But I would also like briefly to offer some thoughts on how I see it impacting the Abraham Accords. First and foremost, I would anticipate continued U.S. backing for what we are doing. Regardless of politics or personalities, there is no doubt that the prospect of better relations among the states of the Middle East is unquestionably in the American interest and a central plank towards achieving many U.S. regional priorities. There is more than sufficient regional experience in the new administration for this to be well understood. But beyond this, I see clear benefits to our countries addressing the new administration with one voice on issues where we share concerns, primarily but not exclusively this means our concerns on Iran, its nuclear and missile programs, and its malign influence on the region more generally. Addressing these pressing issues in a way that fully meets the legitimate concerns of regional states is essential to achieving lasting security and stability in the Middle East. If we can make clear that these concerns are not those of an individual nation, but are deep and widespread across the region, 
And if we are able to do so from a clear common position, then I believe that we will have much more impact in conveying the region's views to our American allies. So this is one more positive effect of working together and one I hope will bring early and positive results. Distinguished participants, I hope that these brief comments have given at least a broad overview of how I see us moving forward, having established diplomatic relations and how this might affect our countries, the region and its peoples in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Zayani. Uh, I think uh, uh, a well-crafted uh, uh, diplomacy and uh, analysis of where we're standing. Thank you for that. And now I would like to invite His Excellency uh, Dr. Gargash to speak. Here is a highlight of Dr. Gargash's bio. Dr. Anwar Muhammad Gargash is a member of the Federal Cabinet of United Arab Emirates and has served as Minister of State for Foreign Affairs since 2008. In addition to his ministerial position, Dr. Gargash was chairman of the National Election Committee. He is the chairman of National Committee for Combat Human Trafficking, member of board of trustees of the Emirates Diplomatic Academy, and many more important positions. Your Excellency, Mr. Gargash, please. Thank you, General Yadin, and thank you to the INSS for hosting us. It is also good to be together with Minister uh, Kavesh Kanazi and Minister Abdel Latif Azayan. It's barely been five months since we announced the Abrahamic Accords, and so much has happened already. Together, we have broken the perception that change in the region is impossible. Peace and dialogue are our tools as we move forward. At the regional level, it's important that we establish a new paradigm uh, of cooperation geared towards a prosperous future for the entire region. Last year was a difficult year for the Middle East as it was for the entire world. There are still many challenges to overcome, but we see that the new wave of dialogue and reconciliation is taking hold now in the Middle East. Even though the difficulties of the pandemic, even through the difficulties of the pandemic, we have seen the energy and enthusiasm among the young people of the region for a new way and a new future. The UAE-Israel opening has been a welcome and long overdue catalyst for still more change. We look forward to establishing a fruitful bilateral relationship with Israel and seek that the Abrahamic Accords will facilitate our ability to help and support international communities, joint efforts to establish a two-state solution and an independent, viable Palestinian state. The Abrahamic Accords should also prioritize tangible goals in order to ensure prosperous and mutually beneficial economic and investment opportunities. The traditional emphasis on politics should be replaced with a clear sense of the ability of political agreements and initiatives to impact and improve economic prospects and indeed the lives of ordinary people. We seek to ensure that the Abrahamic Accords are seen as a catalyst for business and investment. This is all very positive and we still see more hopeful signs. With President Biden taking office, many anticipate a more active American role in the Middle East. In our view, robust American engagement and leadership is most welcome and positive. There's a renewed commitment and possibilities for diplomatic progress in the region. And frankly, after decades of conflict, this is the only way forward. From our perspective, Iran's nefarious activities in the region must be addressed through American leadership and with international support and regional engagement. 
diplomacy and de-escalation are our priorities. And any rational approach must take into account Iran's ballistic missiles and its support for instability in many Arab countries. It is our desire to see long-term solutions through diplomatic engagement that can assure all of us with regard to the forward direction for the entire area. In this context, the UAE will continue to work hard to consolidate its agenda of tolerance as a counterweight to messages of extremism. We believe that the civilizational role of the Abrahamic Accords must not be overlooked or underestimated, for we can disagree about politics, but we must accept each other and work together to ensure a long-lasting regional stability and prosperity. No country should be exempted from this vision, including Israel and the Palestinians. Thank you, Dr. Gargash. And I want to take this opportunity to thank both of you again for hosting uh, the INSS in Abu Dhabi and in Manama. And now uh, the Foreign Minister of Israel, General Ashkenazi, who doesn't need introduction in Israel, but for our audience abroad, uh, I want to introduce him. Uh, Lieutenant General retired Gabi Ashkenazi was sworn as Israel's Minister of Foreign Affairs in May 2020. Before that, he was the 19th Chief of Staff of the Israel Defense Forces. Throughout his long and distinguished career, Foreign Minister Ashkenazi served in many senior capacities, including head of the Northern Command and as Director General of the Ministry of Defense. And now I would like to start our discussion and let me address you with two questions. Uh, to the three of you. Uh, the first one is, why now? What enabled the peace breakthrough with the Emirates and Bahrain that was not possible in previous year? Uh, Gabi, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amos, for uh, hosting me. It's an honor to be with our colleague from uh, Bahrain and uh, the UAE. Not for the first time, I must uh, say, and it's a pleasure. Well, why now? I think uh, it's several reasons. Uh, I think uh, uh, not in the order, uh, but uh, uh, the first one is the, uh, the U.S. administration, uh, the President Trump and his dedicated team uh, and, and their, uh, and their uh, efforts to uh, promote stability, peace, prosperity in the region. Secondly, the bold decision taken by the leaders, mainly from the UAE, uh, the Bahrainis, and, and all the leaders involved, thirdly, uh, I think uh, when it was clear that um, annexation was, I uh, would say, counterproductive and it was moved from the table, uh, removed from the table, it's, in, it's open uh, the door for uh, normalization. And I think another point is the, uh, which was able, enable us, all of us to, uh, as uh, my uh, colleague said, uh, break the old paradigm is the uh, growing understanding, understanding that uh, this region um, has uh, suffered so many co uh, conflicts and now it's time uh, to change this uh, circle, vicious circle of uh, violence with the growing concern uh, with those who are attacking uh, the camp of uh, security, uh, tolerance, prosperity and peace, mainly Iran, as mentioned in, uh, in, in, this, in the opening remark. Uh, I think it's no secret that uh, we are on the same page when it's come to Iran. We are, all of us, and I think most of the uh, region are concerned with the uh, Iranian intention to uh, have a nuclear capability, with the Iranian intention, uh, Iranian um, uh, attempt to increase uh, its hegemony in the region, using Malayan activities, uh, supporting proxies, uh, supporting terror, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's very important to uh, engage. And I'm very happy and optimistic to continue to explore and to promote these with our uh, new friends from the region. So I think all of that, maybe others, and I think young generation are expecting me, expecting to, you know, to um, to have a new horizon and. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm very moved by the excitement and enthusiasm that I see from both sides to this opening. 
So I think it's a, it's a combination of reason. That Thank allowed. you, Gabi. Uh, Mr. Gargash, how do you see it from Abu Dhabi? Well, I, 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 Why now? I have to agree. I have to agree with, uh, with uh, His Excellency Gabi Ashkenazi's assessment. I mean, it is really uh, a combination of things. And clearly also the American role as uh, a conduit for this process was very important. But let me just add our, uh, I think our uh, sort of local flavor to it. I mean, from our perspective, uh, it was important uh, that uh, the cycle of really not going anywhere be broken. I think this was important. And I think uh, over 40, 50 years of disengagement with Israel, we can clearly see that this is not really the best approach, uh, that uh, we have tried disengagement and disengagement was really counterproductive. Uh, but uh, we believe also that it was uh, obvious that engagement was the way, uh, the way forward. Thank you. Uh, from Bahrain, why now? Well, uh, probably it's difficult to add more. Both uh, the ministers have really covered all the, uh, the, the, the stars that uh, my, my brother, uh, Dr. Anwar, have indicated. They, they, they are really, they came uh, into alignment, the stars, and, and, many, and there are many factors. Uh, but above all, I would like to really emphasize the, the, the importance of the boldness that our leaders had, especially His Majesty King Hamid and His Royal Highness uh, Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed. And they really seized the, the opportunity and being able to recognize the opportunity and, and seize it at the right time. Uh, for Bahrain, uh, as I have indicated in my remarks, uh, it, it continues and, and builds upon our, uh, uh, our principles of uh, tolerance and, and openness uh, and also our uh, willingness to reach out the, the hand of, of cooperation and dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And in Israel, we see the, the peace uh, with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain as a chance for a new benchmark for different peace, a warm peace. And now when the celebrations are over, how we feed the expectations uh, that peace will be a different peace, a warm peace. We'll take it in a different order, in the opposite order. So. Uh, Abdul Latif, please. The war and peace will not only uh, just be the, the absence of conflict, but a, a genuine, really, cooperation in, in which we exchange knowledge, commerce, trade, uh, expertise, uh, and also enhance uh, people to people and, uh, and, and enhance the and benefit from the human, the human values that really unite us as, as peoples, as nations, and as countries. Uh, I think war and peace between, between the peoples is, uh, is sometimes that has to be uh, cultivated uh, and, and looked after. We must have the, the patience and, uh, and, and, and provide the environment so that societal level relations uh, evolve uh, naturally. I think these are the, 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 the most fundamental uh, requirement for achieving and maintaining a warm peace. The intent is to have a warm peace, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, incumbent on us to provide that environment to ensure 
that it is achieved and it is maintained and sustained through the people, from the people to the people. Thank you very much. Dr. Gargas, please. Clearly, everything that we have been uh, doing uh, from day one uh, on both sides uh, is to try and build the basis of a normal relationship. So a relationship that has really uh, uh, been built from scratch. So clearly, the various agreements that are cornerstones of any relations that will allow people to travel, uh, work, invest, that will allow companies to cooperate. All these things were uh, from the from the get go, were clear, uh, you know, uh, directives that we had in building this relationship. At the same time, I think the influx of uh, travelers uh, on both sides. Uh, is, an, is very indicative of uh, people wanting to understand the other, people wanting to see the other side. And uh, I expect that, uh, you know, barring COVID, uh, this is something that uh, we will uh, clearly, uh, clearly see. I think the UAE's intention is very, very clear. And that intention is uh, to think strategically about uh, peace with Israel. Uh, and to uh, work on areas uh, of uh, differences, which are uh, mostly political, and to play a role also in trying to help resolve some of these uh, differences. But uh, I think uh, from the start, uh, the, you know, the economic opportunities, the investment uh, part, the travel part, the various elements, uh, uh, of uh, of a people to people relationship have always been present in uh, in our approach thank you gabi please well uh, i think is uh, is uh, is a, is a very important question uh, on the one hand on the other hand i'm very optimistic i think it's our commitment on the governmental level uh, to develop the trust uh, the respect and to lay down the, fi the foundation uh, for, uh, you know, full scope of uh, 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 relationship. We must give the people uh, the proof that they, there are fruits for this uh, declaration, rhetoric, and agreement. They must enjoy the fruit of peace. Uh, and I'm very optimistic. I, uh, based on my relationship uh, with uh, with uh, both our distinguished uh, guests, uh, I see I see a full commitment on the other side uh, to uh, articulate to articulate all the agreements uh, on various fields uh, to facilitate to business to business, people to people, all the interaction. I think it's end of the day. It's story about people, people from both countries who want to have and to share a different future. It might be very simple, but uh, they want to see a change. They, they want a new horizon. They want a new market. They want new friends. And I think it's our commitment and our responsibility to address it and to facilitate uh, uh, these uh, this, uh, desires. Thank you, Gabi. I'm going with your optimism and asking uh, Dr. Gargash, who is next? Who is joining the process? Well, again, uh, I, I would say the UAE has been very, very, uh, you know, uh, careful and circumspect about uh, these decisions because these are sovereign decisions. Uh, and I think each state has its own uh, timeline, its own agenda, its own uh, view of its interests. And as we respect other states, uh, you know, respecting our uh, sovereign decisions, I think we, we also extend that to them. Having said that, I think the more strategic and successful we are with the Abrahamic Accords, uh, the more attractive it will be. So if we think really strategically about this accord. If people can see that these accords 
are basically helping uh, s stability and prosperity in the region and uh, helping uh, you know, the prospects for reconciliation in the region, for resolving uh, issues, for creating more opportunities. I think this sort of strategic outlook uh, will actually uh, make these uh, accords much more attractive. So uh, I think throughout, we have always emphasized that this is not short-term tactical uh, thinking. It's in fact, long-term strategic thinking with a clear-eyed view that we do have uh, major differences when it comes to uh, the two-state solution and the implementation uh, of resolutions on the Palestinian, uh, on an independent, viable Palestinian state. So we're saying uh, where uh, non-communication is not helped, this is the time for communication to help and to, uh, at the same time, to build uh, a viable relationship and make it uh, successful and attractive, which in itself will be a model for many other countries to, uh, to, to join us. How you see uh, the Biden administration policy towards Iran in the Gulf? Are they going back to the JCPOA or they are going to improve the deal? Can it go together? Isn't there tension there? Or maybe you see a possible escalation? Well, Iran is a bipartisan in, uh, issue in, 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 uh, in the United States. I think uh, both administration, and we heard it very clearly from the new administration, not to allow the, uh, Iran to become nuclear. We may have different uh, perspective how to reach it, but I was very encouraged uh, hearing uh, the administration uh, during the last hearings that they have that they are going to uh, have a dialogue with us, uh, with other countries in the region, uh, prior to uh, take a decision. And I think as a good friend, uh, share the same interests. Um, uh, we should leave it to, uh, to discussion, uh, uh, professional discussion uh, in, in, in the room uh, with our friends in the United, uh, United States. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the first point. The second point, definitely, I think the Abrahamic uh, Accord uh, I think increase the uh, the uh, regional voice, and uh, I think that's uh, add another weight uh, to the uh, to the region uh, when we come to a possible solution with the uh, with addressing the Iranian uh, uh, threat, uh, the nuclear region, ballistic sunset, and the others. So I'm I'm not concerned uh, uh, I'm not concerned with the American uh, objective, and I think as a friend we. We should have uh, intimate, transparent, professional uh, dialogue uh, with our friends and uh, to narrow down if there are some gap and to find the best way, uh, if it's uh, possible through a diplomatic uh, uh, agreement, to prevent Iran from having this, uh, uh, having this uh, capability. We as, as Israel, you know my opinion, we could not and we should not allow Iran to have a nuclear capability. That's very clear. Mr. El Zayani, please. Any new text uh, would have to reflect the, the new realities uh, in the region and would need to be uh, acceptable to all the countries of the, of, uh, of the region. Uh, and I do emphasize to pursue it in a political and, and a diplomatic uh, solution. Uh, it's very comforting to hear that uh, uh, Biden and administration is uh, seriously considering including the, uh, the GCC and, and the countries of the region and their consultation. Uh, uh, we need to ensure that any new agreement that does not simply postpone the nuclear capability, uh, but takes that, uh, that prospect 
off the table. Thank you. So we conclude with a personal question. Your Excellencies, what most surprised you in your first meeting with Israelis? What is the vision of Israel for Arab state relation in 2030, 10 years from now? And Gabi, what most surprised you when you met your colleagues in the Gulf? Well, I, uh, the first meeting I had is with uh, uh, His uh, Highness uh, Sheikh Abdallah bin Zayed. Uh, it surprised me uh, that he suggested to meet uh, in, in, in Berlin and to go to the, uh, from all places, to go together to the Holocaust Museum in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, then I realized that they are very sincere when they talk about supporting uh, modernity, uh, tolerance, and uh, fighting extremism and others. Uh, and uh, to see the commitment, uh, you know, after a few hours, uh, I felt like, uh, you know, why we haven't met uh, years, years before. That was my feeling. Thank you again for your optimism. Dr. Garagash, please. When this started, it was uh, quite uh, exciting for, to see. And I was also surprised uh, once uh, we had the Abrahamic Accords of how the Israelis look at the UAE as some sort of uh, very attractive tourist destination. And I think this was something that uh, was quite uh, uh, pleasantly surprising uh, to me. But I think what is more important also is uh, is this uh, the many anecdotal stories, just like what Minister Ashkenazi said, of people meeting each other in the mall, in a restaurant, in, a, in, in the street, in a hotel. And uh, many Israelis, I would say, have uh, you know, seen many young people in the Gulf, many young people in the UAE, and uh, have seen that people uh, want something different. They want to build bridges. They want to uh, look yeah. to the future uh, with uh, positive uh, enthusiasm. And I think all this has been very, very positive. Thank you. His Excellency you. Dr. El Zayani. I think the, the first thing that uh, struck me was the genuine desire for peace uh, and, and the with the, the Israeli leaders, and also the real grasp of, uh, of details and a, a, a quick understanding of the specific areas in all specific areas. Uh, and, but in the year 2030, I would like to be optimistic. I, I hope that we look forward or, or look back and see a, a, a region where Bahrain, UAE, and, and Israel at the center of a peaceful, uh, stable, and thriving uh, Middle East. A, a Palestinian, a Palestinian state uh, that is uh, in peace with uh, with Israel and thriving as its neighbors, and perhaps meeting uh, over coffee with uh, with Gabby and my brother uh, Anwar after. 10 years and looking back on how September 2020 uh, was the month that made all of this possible. I, that's my vision and I hope we will achieve it one day. Shukran. Shukran. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing with us your insight and wisdom and for the most interesting conversation that is, will be broadcast all over the world. I would like also to thank His uh, Majesty, Hamad bin Isa El Khalifa of Bahrain, and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed of Abu Dhabi for their bold decisions and important roles 
in normalizing relation between our countries and our people. Without them, our conversation today would not be possible. I hope that all of you can be with us next year in person and that your optimistic view, uh, Gabi and you, on the future of the region will be realized in the coming year and those that follow. I also hope that next year you will be joined by additional foreign ministers, foreign minister of countries that will follow suit and sign agreements with Israel. Thank you as well to our audience for being with us today. This ends the first day of the conference. We look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's stimulating sessions. Thank you very much. Shukran. Thank you.